Welcome. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives on Thursday, March 17th. We are, have invited in um, Patrick Halliday from the Agency of Education to help us get a background uh, on education quality standards, which is one of the things that has been brought up for consideration in the waiting study uh, report. So Patrick, thank you so much for, for joining us today to give us the 101. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, for the record, my name is Patrick Halliday. I'm the director of the Education Quality Division at the Vermont Agency of Education. Um, thanks to uh, Chair Webb, Vice Chair Capoli, members of the committee. Um, I, you know, I, I have some kind of notes that I'll follow, but please at any point uh, stop in, interrupt me if you, uh, if you have questions, if you want to uh, go into any more detail on any one part of it. And I'll do the best that I uh, they can. And just as a as a little bit of a, a caveat at the outset, I am not an expert on the waiting study, but I can, I'm happy to talk to um, you know to issues about EQS. So um, I probably will pass on some of the questions uh, about the the impact on the waiting study. Okay. With, with that said, uh, just kind of a really high level view the of the Ed Quality Standards. They were I think enacted. First of all, the state board rule, they, uh, they went through the rulemaking process for the, the Vermont State Board of Education. Um, they, I think they were passed in 2013 and then uh, when, were enacted, I believe, like in May of 2014. So they've been around now for about eight years. Um, a lot of the, and they really, the, the, the purpose of them is really to define what good teaching and learning looks like in Vermont. And, and they replaced previous uh, school quality standards, now the education quality standards. I think one important difference between the school quality that predated and the education quality standards were these were not um, maybe aspirational is a, is, a, is, is a term to use for the ed quality standards. They were not uh, a checklist necessarily of things to, to see is a school doing exactly this thing or not exactly this thing, but more uh, guidance for schools um, you know, to, to understand what good looking, uh, good teaching and learning would look like. And they really, sh they've really shaped a lot of the conversation um, over the course of the last, you know, eight years since they came into being. And often um, we'll throw this together with Act 77, the flexible pathways that, that really kind of ushered in, uh, changed the, the, the tone of the conversation about education. Um, and 77, I think was in 2013. So a few highlights. To that uh, this really kind of um, further defined what personalization means for learning uh, and flexible pathways. Um, it gave a lot of discretion to our uh, actual requirement to local school boards to define local graduation uh, requirements, moving away from kind of Carnegie hours, uh, number of hours of students and seats and credits uh, to, um, to allow school boards to have um, have have multiple different ways to define what those graduation requirements are. Um, it kind of uh, really enacted some rules around professional learning uh, requirements that that there needed to be space built into the school day, into the school week, uh, for educators to for, for uh, to engage in, in professional learning. And then the final thing is uh, there's a requirement for all schools to participate in the continuous improvement. Plan, planning process, um, uh, you, a data-driven process uh, to understand that. So, um, so getting a little bit more in, in depth, while the, the, the document isn't, uh, the ed quality standards aren't written specifically in this way, um, the agency, um, after they came into, into being, kind of organized them into five different themes or, uh, or domains and kind of went through all of the different quality standards and said, which one fits in which specific, uh, can, can we categorize them in some way? And the five different categories that were defined were academic proficiency, personalization, safe, healthy schools, high quality staffing and investment priorities. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then, you know, after those categories were, were, were established or, you know, we kind of went and figured out which, which one of these ed quality standards really fit underneath each one of those. Um, and if at any point stop me, and if I'm not seeing a hand, uh, it's a little small on my screen. So just, you know, yeah, I think I see a hand now. Yeah, yeah. yeah Representative Conlon. Another, another question is for the committee. Um, we're on the sort of um, presentation page three. Floor view. Yeah, in case you hadn't uh, gotten there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. 
and actually now moving into page four a little bit to talk about academic proficiency. Um, and you know, the, the kind of the big takeaways on uh, for academic proficiency was uh, were curriculum coordination, which has been further expanded under um, Act 173 uh, to be one of the pillars of, of Act 173. And part of the curriculum uh, coordination really gives the um, the State Board of Education the authority and the requirement to, to set specific learning standards for, for different um, uh, for, for different subject areas. So this is where Common Core Math and Common Core English Language Arts uh, have been the uh, kind of the official curriculum uh, standards. It's not the curriculum, um, but it's the the, the curriculum standards uh, to be met. And this is where next generation science standards, um, the shape PE standards, et cetera, uh, have all come in. Um, along, yeah, um, so this is also a, a lot of discussion about um, uh, local uh, assessments. So every uh, school district has to develop, in addition to the statewide requirements for assessment, its own local comprehensive assessment system. And this is what's outlined in that. Uh, and the idea behind the you know, the statewide assessment system is really a process of, um, of looking at summative assessment at, um, at the end of the year, you know, how are students doing? But summative assessment, while important, is only one part of a good assessment system. And this is where kind of a, a formative local comprehensive assessment system so that you're checking in at all times to see, you know, what's being effective and, you know, understanding, not waiting until, uh, you know, it comes time for an SPAC test, for example. To, uh, to, um, to make those determinations. Um, I mentioned proficiency-based proficiency learning. This is written out uh, explicitly in, um, in several different parts of the uh, ed quality standards, um, defining you know, that that's a, a requirement to have uh, move more towards proficiencies as opposed to, which is a, a demonstration as opposed to um, um, just a, kind of a, a one-time um, testing. Um, graduation requirements were built into this, as I mentioned earlier before. And then in addition to the local comprehensive assessments, uh, this is where the uh, schools need to participate in the, the um, or all LEAs, um, SUs, SDs need to participate in the identified state assessments as well. Um, I've thrown a whole lot, uh, well, actually, let me throw one more thing at you before um, stop a little bit. Under the graduation requirements too, um, are some, there's some specific language for students who are eligible for uh, special education or 504 supports. Um, so, you know, to, to ensure that uh, they receive a regular diploma, not, you know, some diploma that would have uh, effectively an asterisk on it. Um, and that, um, that those modifications that are uh, that are uh, required under their um, their individual education plans are reflected in their uh, professional or uh, their personalized learning plans. Um, pause here to see if anyone has any questions about the academic proficiency portion of that. Representative Austin. Yes. Hi. Thank you. I'm wondering how um, the uh, assessments are calibrated across the state. So if a student from Canaan from second grade was going to South Burlington, would they kind of come in uh, with, you know, seamlessly into, let's say, a second grade, you know, reading paper because they would have had the skills and knowledge? Yeah, so um, there's not, I mean, some, some states, some schools have kind of uh, pacing guidelines that, um, that are, you know, that are constant across the entire, the entire uh, state. France has pacing guidelines that are constant across the entire country. And if you go to any second grade classroom in, in, in anywhere in France, more or less, they're doing the same thing on the same day. I mean, that, that's an oversimplification. That level of uh, of consistency is not required under this. Um, you know, there's a requirement to make sure that these are the standards that are being taught, um, or that, that are that are being assessed, with some flexibility in that. Um, the way that I think that there, and and there are some some folks um, on the student pathways who are are probably a little bit. Um, not probably, who are definitely a little bit smarter uh, to talk in, in more detail about, about this. Um, but the way that it's really assessed is um, 
through the, 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 the commonality across oh. the state is through the, the summative assessments. So this would be the SBAC sort of testing um, and, and other you know, common um, test requirements across the state. Um, there can be there, um, some local, um, you know, the local comprehensive assessment systems um, are going to have differences because they're local and each uh, LEA is making the decision as to what system that they're going to do. Um, if you're coming from Canaan and moving to South Burlington, there may be, uh, there may be differences in, 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 in what's being done. Uh, there was, um, you know, uh, oh gosh, well, there's pre-pandemic, that's all I can say, and time is uh, a, a little bit of a mix up right now. Um, but I know that the agency invested in, um, 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 I'm just blanking on the name right now, um, the, the Lexile uh, ability so that all schools uh, could in, use Lexile if they chose to do that as part of their local comprehensive assessment, which would allow that sort of uh, continuity from district to district. Now, I don't think every school has chosen to go that direction, but they have uh, they have the ability to do that if they want to have that consistency. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We can keep going. Great. So I'm moving on to the personalization page, uh, which is the, the fifth page on the, the presentation that I shared out. Um, and, and these are the things, I think this is really uh, one of the big distinguishing points for the ed quality standards. And this is really, um, I, I think in, speaking more uh, as a teacher than as uh, you know someone from the AOE, this is really, I think, the, the big um point of departure head, headline making uh, part of the ed quality standards that really took things like personalized learning plans and made them required for seventh and 12th graders. This is where it said that schools need to offer flexible pathways, uh, kind of anytime, anywhere learning. Um, there is also uh, a dual enrollment uh, fits in under that as well. Um, the idea of a full breadth of courses to make sure that someone who is eligible for uh, special education is eligible for special education, uh, but not um, but not at the expense of their core education. So that um, that this is not um, this is really going to integrate students more more fully into uh, all students more fully into uh, the core curriculum. And then <laughs> through the ideas of flexible pathways, personalized learning, giving students a lot of agency in their own education. Um, and, you know, and this manifests in, in, in multiple different ways. Uh, this was, um, uh, you know, this is where CTE centers have had a lot more um, uh, ability to, you know, to, to offer, you know, kind of diverse courses. This is where students are, uh, the work-based learning coordinators are overseeing students going out into the communities and in internships or externships, um, you know, to, to really work in, in their communities and get credit for that work that they're doing. Um, this is where some schools, this may seem, um, you know, relatively small, but schools we're uh, more uh, likely to give um, PE credits for students who were already participating in, in athletics as opposed to taking additional PE courses, um, for, you know, saying that, that as a flexible pathway, yes, we understand that you're active and engaged in what's going on. Um, any questions about the personalization or anything further uh, in more detail that um, you know, would like to hear about that? Any questions, Representative Austin? Yeah, I'm just wondering how it's measured. You know, what kind of data comes out of, I mean, that's input. I'm wondering how you measure, you know, that the kids are meeting the educational quality standards, you know, using, I know you talked about proficiency-based report cards just before COVID hit. And I assume that was, it was at different levels of implementation across the state and, you know, I'm just not sure where that is. Yeah. Now. How's it working? Is it kind of? Yeah. Uh so that's a great question. Um, and again, uh, the proficiency based report cards, I think, is, you know, it, it, they're, you know, this is something I've been working on just out of my own interest as a way to better represent student learning, you know, going back uh, more years now than I would like to admit, you know, 25 plus years in, in, in education. Um, and you're know, trying to understand that, you know, what does a, a B in a fifth grade reading class mean? Like, you know, it doesn't mean, 
you know, as a teacher, the, the secret is it, it doesn't mean anything because you could be a great reader or you could be a struggling reader and both get a B based on, you know, how we would have done things 25 years ago. And so, um, you know, the idea behind this for a proficiency-based report card is be very specific is here are the learning standards. Here is how this particular student is, you know, is, is doing and meeting those learning standards and collecting data. Um, I, I also to address this, I kind of, um, you know, I'm looking at page nine of what I sent to you right now, just jumping forward a little bit. And I think it's your question, um, it suggests jumping toward kind of the, the logic behind um, the, the larger system to, you know, to do this is that we start with the education quality standards, and this is what's defining good teaching and learning at the state level. And I'm only speaking now at the state level that we have uh, our education quality reviews, which are two different ways of measuring how well a school is doing in meeting those education quality standards. So, um, you know, we have our annual snapshot, which we hope to come out very, very soon for uh, the 2021 school year, um, which are common measures for every single school uh, in, the, in the state. Well, I'll say this, for every single LEA in the state. You know, we don't measure graduation rates in elementary schools, so it's not, there are some differences according uh, to the school level. Um, and those, you know, the, the different metrics, there are about 18 different metrics in that um, are organized around these same five. And I've, I've spoken with you guys. I know about this probably more times than you want to hear in the past. Um, but they're organized around these same five uh, themes. But that's only, you know, that's only one part of the state one. The other that's essential are the integrated field reviews. And these take place every three years where we go uh, and we, um, the, the agency, facilitates this, the agency of ed facilitates this, but really the important work is done by, uh, you know, peers of the school uh, that's going through or the, the, the LEA that's going through the integrated field review, where we go in and we ask a whole bunch of questions and um, look at what's going on in the classroom. We have a bunch of prompts that are, uh, that are linked again around these, these same five uh, domains. Um, We've had a few changes to the integrated field review so that we have uh, uh, about a third of the, the questions are common to every single school. Uh, about a third of the questions are you know, unique, or I should say to every single uh, SUSD. About a third of the questions are unique to that um, SUSD uh, based on our review of, of what they've submitted, um, their continuous improvement plans, et cetera. And then about a third of the questions are ones that are generated by that uh, SUSD itself to say, here are the things that we've been working on, and we want you to hold a mirror up to us to see, well, you know, how are we doing in meeting those, those particular things? Um, and then the data that comes from the annual snapshot, the integrated field review, and then from the local, all of the local data um, kind of gets funneled into the creation of the continuous improvement plan. So going back to something as simple, uh, what seems as simple and, and, and unique as um, uh, a proficiency-based report card, um, it's that's helpful for a teacher, that's helpful for a parent and student to understand what's, uh, what's going on. But it's also then essential at the district, at the school level to aggregate and see what sort of trends are taking place across those report cards. And then at the district level to aggregate to see what sort of trends are taking place across schools, all that funneling into a continuous improvement plan to figure out what the particular uh, needs and challenges of the school are all back with reference to the education quality standards that, you know, that, that kind of define this at, at the outset. So I may have gone a little bit off the rails with my answer to that, but, I, you know, so if, if there's, if there's further clarification or follow-up questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. I'm sure it's going to generate a lot. And I, and just in, in terms of the um, continuous improvement plans and your oversight, how, how, how many are you reviewing in a year? Um, for the continuous improvement plans, um, up until this year, every school has had to, um, has, well, this is actually something that's written into the education quality standards. We have it organized under the investment priorities section. Um, it's a little, in, it, that, that continuous improvement plans um, have to be done at least every two years by a school and reviewed annually. Um, that has been, um, most schools have been doing those annually all along. I mean, 
without getting too far into continuous improvement, it's continuous. So um, it's really uh, when something is submitted, that's a really a, a point in time photograph of uh, of a moving picture. So it's um, you know it's taking a still off of a movie because things are going to be evolving all the time as you get uh, additional data. But to answer your question, it is. Um, um, starting this year, we're really pushing schools to only submit every two years so that they really take more time uh, to engage in those continuous improvement efforts that they outline in their plans, with the exception of schools that are eligible for comprehensive supports under uh, ESSA, not ESSER, but ESSA, the law that passed back in 2015, um, and those schools that are uh, eligible for comprehensive supports um, are still submitting their continuous improvement plans uh, annually, and that is uh, 15 schools in the state, not 15 districts, but 15 uh, schools in the state have uh, an additional continuous improvement requirement. And what does continuous improvement look like? So, um, so what it looks like in our office is there is a, um, you know, there is a, a, a continuous improvement plan template that needs to be submitted and it identifies what the goals are, what the implementation strategies are going to be, what the source of funds are going to be, uh, what the data is that determine that this is something that's, um, that is a goal. Um, and what the outcomes are that you're going to be using at the local level to measure whether you've been effective or not. But that's only what's submitted. Schools do a whole lot more than that. It just doesn't, we don't require it now to be submitted around their uh, comprehensive needs assessment to really dig deeply into their data to understand, um, you know, what their, what their strengths and needs are um, by, you know, and, and in fact, we've been, uh, schools have been participating for the last uh, year um, in, a, in a data literacy series that we just met yesterday for maybe their seventh or eighth meeting um, that's, that's been hosted by WestEd for helping schools to better understand how to make sense of, of that data. But those continuous uh, uh, comprehensive needs assessments are really the, uh, an essential part of the plan because that identifies what schools ha are going to be investing um, their time and their resources uh, into over the course of the year and really understanding what the needs of uh, the community of the schools of teachers uh, in those schools might be. Uh, Representative James. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. Um, I, I did have a couple of questions related to um, the work of the waiting task force, but not, you know, not a deep dive on the waiting study. So hopefully these are, these are relevant. Um, I was just looking back at our, our report um, that we delivered in, in December, and I, I knew we had had a section on the EQS, and I wanted to follow up. That in our report, it said that um, Secretary French recommended that the um, EQA process be updated and expanded to focus on school districts rather than schools and be formally described in new and revised regulation. Um, so it sounds like Secretary French was calling on us to really update um, and revamp the EQA. And he said that the, at that time, the AOE and the state board were reviewing the education rules and that they were gonna be issuing a report later this year. So that would have been 2021, I guess. Um, so do you, do you know where that work stands? Have, have AOE and the state board gotten into the, this EQA section yet? Or where does the, where, do, where is Secretary French's recommendation to update these stand right now? And then I have a related follow-up question. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm only gonna be marginally helpful with that. I, I really don't know where, the, where that conversation with the State Board of Education uh, is sitting right now. Um, that's really a question that uh, that Chair Olson or our Secretary French would be better to to address. Um, the one thing I am, you know, feel comfortable trying to you know to answer is that I think that you, you've touched on something else that's really important that has come out of the um, the Ed Quality Standards is really changing the the unit of analysis from the school to uh, the the LEA the the, the SUSD to to really. Um, work more systemically to to address problems as opposed to or not problems to address education 
good, bad, organized, but to, to, to create systems, um, you know, to, to understand what's going on as opposed to individual schools who are, who are being um, uh, at, as the unit of analysis. Um, that said, where uh, those conversations with the state board and, uh, and the secretary stand right now, um, I really, I really don't have anything that I, um, that I can add to that. I'm just going to stop for just one second. And Amanda, let's, um, let's schedule some time also with the secretary and with Chair Olson um, to respond to that question that was raised in the, perhaps you could, um, Kathleen, could you formulate that question? Yeah, I will. Or Amanda, yeah, we'll follow up on that. Okay, thank you, um, Patrick. I did have another yeah. question. Oh, yeah, excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah. And I, I just have a related question. I, I just want to make sure that, um, you know, as a committee, that we're focusing whatever we do here uh, specifically on the recommendations of the task force. Like, that's that's kind of our mission. Um, so, so that was the one. And the second is that um, we recommended, it looks like the Senate bill, the Senate waiting bill, recommended two full-time uh employees be added at aoe to work specifically on the eqa process and i just wondered how your capacity is um you know how you would envision using those two folks um how they how they would be helpful and how necessary they are um so i i i'm, I'm not i'm not 100 percent familiar with the specifics of what those uh, where those FTEs would would be used. What I can say is that we have a team of um, of five people in our division who really work very, very closely with all of the um, the SUs, SDs in support of their continuous improvement process. Um, that means that we have one of our education quality coordinators roughly working with 10 different districts. Um, and uh, almost, uh, this is an analogy, this isn't you know, kind of, kind of a, a factual, but almost uh, as embedded uh, simultaneously in, in, you know, in 10 of those different districts to, you know, to, to, to do whatever is needed to, to help them meet their, uh, their continuous improvement goals. Um, that's, a, that's, that's very difficult. Um, and it's very difficult to provide uh, a great level of support, uh, a comprehensive level of support to each of the districts with that uh, level of staffing, uh, especially when um, that same group of five people, uh, the vast majority of, the, um, of all of the ESSER funding, review of applications, monitoring of uh, that has fallen on that same group of people, which is entirely new work uh, to that okay. team. So it, it, it has certainly been a challenge over the, I mean, you know, you know, what was me? Uh, the, the, everyone's had challenges over the last two years, but, um, you know, this has really been a challenge uh, on the workload of those, uh, of those ed quality coordinators to provide high quality support for those districts in their continuous improvement process. And, um, and you know, if additional support came, um, uh, we would find ways to, to put them to use. Patrick. Yeah, on the same uh, topic, um, I think part of the, well, I guess the question for you would be, um, is there some consideration going on now, um, especially with the idea of adding additional staff to modify the integrated field review process? And I think that that's partly because, you know, A, under pupil waiting, the question came up about, well, you know, what, how good a job are we doing making sure that the money that we're spending on education is actually doing what we hope it will do. Um, but also, too, I think it's uh, reflective of people in the field, and we specifically had testimony from the NEA, but also others that say that, you know, the integrated field reviews aren't exactly a very strong enforcement mechanism for making sure that schools are meeting their EQS. And I guess I'm curious to know if there's broader talk going on about, I guess a more robust, I hate to use the word enforcement, but let's call it enforcement mechanism for making yeah. sure all schools are providing what they need to provide. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, the, and I'm, I'm, I'm really not trying to dodge it when I say this, but the integrated field reviews at their design were not 
intended to be an enforcement mechanism. They were really intended to be um, uh, uh, an opportunity to get specifically you know, into schools, find out what's going on, and say back to schools, here are some things that, that we noticed. Here are some things that we noticed that you are doing really, really well. Here are some things that you might want to give some attention to. Um, and you know, here are some, some really specific recommendations but they do not have the, you know, the force of, um, you know, the, the force of kind of uh, you know, enforcement, I think was, it was the word that you used. And that was by design uh, because they were meant to be a collaborative process. They were, it was really essential part of that, that, um, you know, if I were, if, if the review was taking place in Essex North, that we, uh, you know, the really important part of that review is that folks from Kingdom East were participating in that, and they were the ones who were going into the, and, and other neighboring uh, districts were going into that, you know, to, to look, to learn, and, uh, and to give kind of their, their expert uh, advice around that. Um, I mentioned, you know, the, the, the integrated field reviews started in 2016. We, you know, they were um, on a three-year cycle. So every school, uh, they, they, were, they started in 2016 as pilots, uh, going to be um, reviewed on a three-year cycle. We were just finishing up the first cycle of those reviews when COVID hit. Um, and so we we're at the, the point where we were thinking about, um, well, we'd started the work when COVID hit. <clears throat> To really um, to rethink uh, to read you know from a continuous uh, learning perspective, a continuous improvement perspective, to really say what has worked and what are the things now that we need to be uh, to change the the process on that, um, and um, that's you know we're in the midst of doing that that design, we were in the midst of doing that design change when uh, we've had to shut down the integrated field reviews over the course of the last uh, two years just starting again next week two weeks to have our first integrated field review again so you know fingers crossed but that doesn't exactly get your to uh, i understand that doesn't exactly get to your question um you know from our perspective the integrated field reviews um, are not intended, still not intended to be an enforcement mechanism. There was something that was closer to that, you know, under the school uh, quality standards where it was much more of a checklist, um, but it was really meant to be uh, a collaborative process to say, here are some things that you need to be, that you might want to be thinking about. That said, you know, the example that we will just often use as, you know, as a silly example, um, if there are rats running in the cafeteria, we can't not see that, you know, so that there will, there could be some egregious things that are taking place that when you're on an integrated field review, we would have to draw attention to. Um, but, um, but in general, it was not intended to be uh, an enforcement mechanism. Thank you. It's obviously a very interesting topic. So you can keep going. So, uh, you know, a, a couple other things just to, you know, I know that we're coming up in time and I don't know exactly what your schedule is, or I guess maybe even a couple minutes over, but uh, a couple of just quick highlights, uh, you know, to, to draw to that uh, this is where the, the tiered system of support um, has come into being. Um, we have our MTSS team or VT MTSS team uh, really working and focusing on the um, social emotional health and physical well-being of students, um, which we think is, uh, is, is really important and kind of codified those supports into, uh, into rules. Um, and uh, a couple of other things that uh, staffing ratios were outlined in this, and this is one that is a little bit more of, you know, a checklist that can be, uh, that can be done, um, that um, the staffing ratios based on the age of the students and for uh, library and school the school librarians, school nurses, school counselors. Um, <clears throat> if a school is unable to meet those staffing needs uh, ratios for whatever point, um, there is a waiver process that they can you know, apply to um, the agency for a waiver if they say, um, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I think school librarian is um, at the high school hundred um, students to every school librarian. If they end up with 310 students to every school librarian. Uh, a school can submit a waiver to, you know, to say that, you know, um, uh, from meeting that requirement that um, that that's decided by the uh, by the secretary. Um, 
And then I think the other important thing that I just wanted to say is that, you know, this also supported the idea of the student data systems, which I'm sure you've heard of, you know, through the SLDS that has come forward and passed as a way that schools are required to, to have a way that they're, uh, that they're maintaining their, their data. I think the final thing that I would like to say, uh, happy to answer, you know, additional questions is that this also drove um, how we organized um, a lot of the work that's done in the agency. So uh, the different divisions in the agency more or less map on to um, a lot of these different, uh, these, these five different categories. Um, the, the, the student pathways division uh, contains largely the, uh, the personalization and the academic proficiency work, although there's some crossover around the assessment side with our, uh, our data division. Uh, the finance division, uh, as well as uh, the data division, really kind of have the investment priorities work. Um, the high quality staffing lies largely within, uh, within our division, the education quality team. And then uh, the safe, health, healthy schools lies largely in uh, the student support services division. So um, that was intentional and there was a large reorganization uh, in order to, you know, to best meet the needs of schools aligned with the education quality standard. Okay. Questions, Representative Harrison. Good morning. Um, my question is going to revolve around your slide for safe and healthy schools. Last year's Act 72 had a component for, for required facility managers in the districts. Mm -hmm. And what my question is, is AOE, uh, is, is, is there any follow up on that? And there really weren't any reporting requirements in the act. But what my, I guess what my question is, um, does AOE have a database to know that the schools are complying with all codes and who I'm assuming that fire prevention does most of the inspections and does AOE keep a record of when I'm, if it's up to date? Uh, I don't know. That's a great question. Uh, I, I really don't know. I'm, I'm happy to track that down. My guess is that Jill Briggs Campbell would be the one who would know that answer. And I'm, I'm happy to reach out to her and uh, get back to you. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn to by two members of the waiting task force. Is there anything else? We have two members who were on the waiting task force. Mm -hmm. um, anything that you want to add or, or question at this point as we move forward in this conversation? I think Kat hit really the, the yeah. bigger points. I think yeah, so. not, not really, Patrick. I um, I just think we should, you know, we'll reflect back on the report and the Senate bill and yeah. make sure we have a clear and tightly defined understanding of what what we need to be doing. Right. Yeah. And we'll, we'll yeah. have. State Board of Ed and the Secretary and to break this with any of their thinking on the matter. Representative Austin? This might be for Kat and Patrick, but um, in the report, it, it seemed like I'm not clear if you came out with a, a data point in terms of poverty, if you decided on whether free, and, and you might have, I, I, I might, you know, I, it was. I did read it. And no, no, that that wasn't why my eyebrows. Oh, that wasn't an eyebrow moment. Sorry, okay. sorry, Rep. Austin. So just when I'm looking at the dashboard and I'm seeing free and reduced lunch data, is that fairly an accurate uh, picture of the poverty in that school? So, so when you look. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. You please. go, Patrick. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I, my actually, my question or my answer is probably going to be unsatisfactory. When you're when you're looking at the uh, the dashboard um, right now, that is just a re reference based on the poverty based simply on free and reduced lunch. There is a, a larger conversation that you're probably aware of uh, to rethink the way that that's being calculated. Um, but any data that's currently being published would be reflected of the free and reduced lunch. Future data may be taking on, you know, a different, um, a, you know, a different calculation, um, and really, Ann Bardinaro is the one who um, who's in the, the the consolidated federal programs, and that's where uh, school the school lunch program uh, lives is the one who's kind of overseeing that that process. But so you may have something yeah. to add to that. Just to determine poverty in a school, when you look at right now, is that 
somewhat accurate because that has something to do with the data as well. You know, the um, kind of the aspects for us. For my, when I'm looking at those two things, um, is that I just want to be sure yeah. my assumption is correct. It's 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 as is it accurate? Uh, it's as accurate as it is in terms of you know parents and community members. Members filling out their, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and guardians filling out um, their free and reduced lunch applications, getting them back in. Um, you know, so so uh, do people slip through the cracks because those aren't filled out, or, they, or folks don't understand that they need to be filled out, or how to fill them out, or need support? Absolutely, um, which is why you know, look, one reason to look for uh, for alternate ways of, of measuring that. Um, but um, it, it certainly reflects accurately the number of, of um, the number of students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch according to the knowledge of that individual uh, school system. Great, thank you very much. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, this is, this is a helpful um, no. beginning as we look at this and prepare for the learning study bill. Um, to have a better understanding of your problem. What is your staff currently? I'm sorry? What is your staffing currently for your... Uh, specifically to the ed quality standard side of it, we uh, five five people who, who really work specifically with the ed quality um, work. Um, we have a larger staff for the... Um, we have a larger staff for the full uh, division, but working specifically on, on ed quality work with the continuous improvement team, there are five, four and a half people whose time is dedicated to that. Yeah. Okay, we may wanna bring you back as we begin to look at this and I very much appreciate your testimony. Happy to come back whenever. Thank you. Okay. We have a little break. Um, Secretary French will be in at 10 o'clock. Um, he's going to give us the pandemic recovery update. We also have a new report on the uh, inclusion, suspension, expulsion, which um, Amanda is going to work to get testimony on that. It's actually on our website if folks want to take a look at that. Um, but we will have someone to come in and present that to us if you're able to ask questions. Okay. Um, then after that, we will have an opportunity to do a little bit more on education finance um, as we prepare for that, that bill. And with that, I, unless there are any other comments or questions or something, we'll take a little break.